Hi, welcome to another Austin Software Cooperatives Meetup. This is our first meetup of the year. Uh, we're doing a book review this month on Design Justice, Community-Led Practices to Build the Worlds We Need by Sasha Costanza Chalk, or Chok. And we're gonna look at a mind map that Watson's put together and discuss uh, whatever is interesting to folks on the call. Uh, this will be published on YouTube. It'll go up probably about a month from now. Um, so you, this is recorded. Anyways, thanks everyone. You, you ready, Watson? Yes, I am. All right. All right. <clears throat> So design justice, uh, I've been getting some feedback from people over the months. Uh, I know some people enjoyed the book. So I kind of want to get first impressions uh, before I before I get into it on uh, maybe why you enjoyed uh, the book and maybe what did you learn this First impressions from anybody that wants to offer a month. Nobody yet? <laughs> Jeff raises the hand. Just start speaking, Jeff. So yeah, you know me. I'm not shy about this. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I thought this was the book I was waiting for in a lot of ways because the impact that technology is having on our built world the sort of like the whole the vocabulary that I didn't even have to talk about this thing that I kind of knew was really important to start thinking about. And this book helps start to think about it. Mm, okay. Sounds good. Uh, who else? anyone else now some of you are listening because it has an audio so some of you are listening just first impressions anything i mean we can get into critiques later if you like but uh something positive <laughs> all right let's just jump in here to the introduction <clears throat> first chapter uh so um one of the things that jumped out to me immediately <clears throat> about the book is high the high priority that's put on uh, lived experience uh, as, as a form of maybe you could say argumentation. So um, saying that if you're going to be interacting in the world and you're going to have things that are artifacts, things that are designed, created by humans for you, or that you, or not for you, uh, but that you have to use. Being excluded from that process, or uh, maybe getting ahead of myself, but not having the things that are important to you part of the artifact. Um, how do you? How do we? You know, is that a problem? How do we solve that problem? And uh, using lived experience, so <clears throat> saying that everybody that uh, has to use or participates in using an artifact, their experience with using it is an artifact, is kind of an argument or should ought to 
influence how uh, that artifact was designed. Uh, <clears throat> the language that I like is affected interest. So whoever's affected by a thing should have input into the design for a thing. They kind of implicitly use that uh, language. Um, that's kind of the first kind of the overarching uh, idea here. I'm going to stop there and see, does anybody else have any, does that trigger anything for, for people on what they think about the book as far as the major themes, anything like that? I didn't read the book, but it resonates with something that I read recently in a book around introducing change into organizations. It talks about the reason the top-down change is uh, usually fail is because the people, even though they might agree with a particular change, if they don't own the change, if change is just you know thrown upon them, they will reject it. So they need a participating hand in any particular direction in order to assimilate and accept that change. So it resonates with what you were saying. Loving what you're saying. So there's a couple of words you used, owned, right? And then failed. Some of those things, this, this book and, um, I, I, I forget who is it that recommended this, recommended this book. I, I don't know if it was Taylor. I don't know who it was, but this book, it, it was it, Taylor. It, really, it was Taylor. Okay. It has a lot to do with some of the struggles, uh, that we have as a cooperative kind of in many different dimensions. Um, but <clears throat> something that that weighs heavy on me um, kind of bugs me, and they touched on it, but it's in chapter two, I think, is um, the concept of, so we have justice, so we have what's right or what ought to be, that kind of thing. And then we have failure, so pragmatic. If we do what works, I would submit to you and everyone else that what's pragmatic doesn't mean justice. Something can work and be oppressive. It works according to the people who uh, are implementing it. So the, the, the whole concept of we put together, we were inclusive or we weren't inclusive and all the stuff and the project failed because we didn't include enough people and all of that. The author actually uh, covers the, the idea, and I'll use some of the language in the, in the book, the capitalist idea of, okay, we, we were able to serve the majority of the people who are the users and we were to make money, oh, whatever, and it worked, uh, but it wasn't just. So you can have a failure, but you were just. You can have a success, as far as success rated as money, and it'd be unjust. We're doing the raising hands. I'm I'm good with just people just start talking. So <laughs> go ahead, because I might miss the raise hand thing. It's really small, my screen. <laughs> Fair. Um, yeah, I didn't want to interrupt, but I was. Yeah, I I think that um, I think what I hear you talking about is basically like a big piece of this book is about power, right? And how power shows up and that like where justice is kind of perceived in a theoretical sense is perceived outside of power, right? That like justice is, is supposed <laughs> to be fair. Um, and in reality, of course, we're in systems of inequity, 
Um, and there is power, there is, there are disparities of power. And so that's, I think, um, I think that's one of the pieces in this book about that, that it's, um, I don't remember who said the piece about um, if somebody doesn't own the decision, they reject it, um, even if, even if they like it, um, or like would like it. And I think that part of what's built into that example is a like there are roles in there that are unstated right that it was like somebody else presumably who was like quote unquote in power um designed something for a bunch of people who did not have design power and then it's like whether or not those people accept it or reject it and even in the in the opportunity opportunity to accept or reject there's some power right but there are other instances mm -hmm. where there is no question of accepting or rejecting right and so i think that a piece a piece that's really teased out here is this like where does the power sit and what does it mean to design for versus designing with um and that's where this like lived experience piece comes in right is that like that mm -hmm. that that designing with people with the lived experience um yeah. who carry the lived experience of interacting with that artifact and having it impact them that they should be having decision power right that there should be a redis like they should not be the ones that have no power in the design process right yes <clears throat> right and uh, uh taking a risk here is getting too philosophical but really it's, um, the underlying view of what you're saying with power, the philosophical force, and I want to say the stance, the ethical stance that the author is taking, it's really, and, and she, she quotes Foucault as a philosopher, and his style of argumentation is to trace the history of power where even where it goes into how people use language and to try to say you know i might be murdering um uh, you know butchering this but um trying to say how it's kind of arbitrary in in ways and you re we really should be um accepting that, knowing that at all points. And a way to combat that is the lived experience and all that. That's kind of how we interpret Foucault now is lived experience um, is how we should be critiquing uh, everything that we consume. Uh, and, and so, yeah, power is really, <laughs> a big theme of the book and um i have to say uh, like a kind of a full disclosure for me i'm kind of on i'm kind of on the opposite side for this so it's hard for me i i can be objective i like foucault and everything but i am of the the side of it's very um, nihilistic. So what if there's a bunch of people, um, or, or or if there's if power is concentrated somewhere, it, it comes to the point of you need to somehow take a stance on. Okay, we want equality, well, but okay, do we really want equality, or do we want equitability? How do we meet that out? Now, how I reconciled that with this book, it, I think the author was drawing from the ethical stance, the position, the power, or I say power, but the position, the force of the argumentation is coming from legislation. So saying that there are protected groups that we've already decided, we know, that there are protected groups, so racial groups, gender groups, um, 
you know, so on and so forth, sexual orientation, these types of things. Already that we kind of already agree um, that are marginalized and we should do something about their marginalization. So I want to say that the book didn't try to ethically argue for, oh, we need to do something about this. And uh, th it just says, we already know that. And so, since we already know that something needs to be done about this, there's a power structure, hierarchy, all that stuff. Here's a way to stop it, and we're going to do this design justice. So that's how I was able, for me personally, reading book. That's how I was able to come back and say, okay, it's a F, it's a book about justice, distributed justice, so on and so forth. This is how the argumentation is going, right? So let's go ahead and have equity. Here's some groups historically have been you know, had a problem for, for everybody on the call, you might say, yeah, that's obvious watching what, what are you talking about? But for me, uh, I had to go through all of that in order to, to reconcile things. Um, does anyone else, I mean, as far as the, the first chapter, does anyone, does anything jump out uh, for anyone before I get into it? I wanna get into some of these, um, arguments that they had for, uh, not arguments, but definitions uh, for design. Go through here. Some of these things, I don't know. I mean, a bunch of us are in the field, in the software field. I thought a bunch of this stuff is very useful for us, um, especially, I liked I'm get ahead of myself with her descriptions of open source. So let's go ahead and talk about this. <laughs> Which Design was it this justice. chapter? Or the, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, was it this, this chapter or the next the one? Where? Oh, this is the introduction. Yeah. I'm thinking which yeah. which chapter does she talk about the matrix of of domination? Chapter one. Yeah. Okay, so that, so we're not there yet. Yeah, uh, but in this first introduction, I'm going to go ahead and talk about the matrix do domination just so that we make sure that we, she does a review of every chapter, so I thought that it might be good to go over it of everything just in case we don't have time, but we'll go over it. Go a little more in depth in the first chapter, but um, <clears throat> so here's some, there's a Design Justice Network site and net, um, community and so on and so forth. Let's talk about some of the things. So it's try, trying to tease out what the, the meaning is for design justice. We will use design to sustain, heal, empower our communities as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. That word exploitative, you know, has a uh, is pregnant with meaning. So we can come back to that. We centered the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. We prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. We view change as emergent from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process rather than as a point uh, at the end of the process. We see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. We believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience and that we all have a unique and brilliant contributions to bring to a design process. We share design uh, knowledge and tools with our communities. We work towards sustainable community-led and controlled outcomes. We work towards non-exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and to each other. Before seeking new design solutions, we look for what is already working at the community level. We honor and uplift traditional indigenous and local knowledge and practices. There's a lot uh, said here. One of the uh, things with exploitative, I think this word, when people use this word, they mean 
bunch of different things. Um, historically, on in our group, exploitative means if you were a part of the creation of a thing and you don't get to say, you don't get to say or have any input on the surplus that comes from generating that widget. That's exploitation. Now, I've always had this challenge of what does exploitation mean if it doesn't mean what I just said? Um, that on one side, someone can say it's stealing, like outright stealing. You own a thing, I took it. Uh, on the other side, it's just you could say whatever it is that makes you uncomfortable or something like that. I don't know. The word is uh, really ideological, I should say, and it takes um, it takes some, I guess, reasoning to tease out some kind of non-ambiguous meaning. But I think if you use that meaning, you can get through this book and try to say, oh, Yes, there's some justice to be had here in, in order to try to say non exploitative. But uh, what does everyone else think? Buy it here. I know people like this book. So these principles are about getting people involved. One of the things later on in the book, we probably won't get to, but I thought, and you can kind of tell, it's from experience that they went through, tried to get this participatory design process, using it with people, holding the people accountable they have a solution for that and they, they prioritize that. Um, if you're going to do something like this, if anyone's a designer on the call, we've historically, <laughs> what the designers that I know, they are hostile to design by committee. So uh, it's quite, I, I, my ears perk up whenever there's any type of collaborative design thing because I know there's a contention. And um, so some way to hold people accountable, some way to, um, so that there can be some pushback and people can't just throw something over the wall and then disappear. We see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert kind of, um, probably influenced from like the agile community, so on and so forth, trying to uh, make sure that we don't have the top down, oh, I'm the expert, do what I say, even though you're in the meeting, set your mouth kind of situation going on. You have the facilitator that mediates that and adds a lot of value in order to actually make it work. Um, we believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions. It kind of, that one, I think this is one of those statements where at first I'm like, ah, oh, they don't believe this. And then later reading, I think she actually does believe what she's saying. There's people who get a PhD in, in user factors and like we know some and the, they're that person is on the same level as someone who just uses a thing uses an artifact i think you can re reconcile that by saying they're an expert again when they're saying their their lived experience they're an, an, an expert in bringing to the table uh their views or their features that only their uh, background would know about and they need to be in the room, something like that. 
I think this statement is it, it's a controversial, uh, but I think it's true. Community love, uh, I'm sorry, community led uh, controlled outcomes. Yeah, so does anyone have any, is, these rules, do they jump out at anyone as controversial or they just seem intuitive? And like, obviously that's true to everyone. What jumps out? Anything? <laughs> I mean, this is going to take time to, for me to process this whole book. Like I said, I'm going to go over, I'm going to read it a couple of times and then follow the resources. But, um, you know, she starts out earlier on mentioning Paolo Freire. I consider myself a Frarian and the whole idea that, uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, well, also uh, intersectionality, which we haven't talked about yet, that there are this there there is this matrix of oppression. And if we want non exploitive systems that allow human beings uh, to develop fully, then we need to understand the matrix of oppression and 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 how the the world that is being built around us is is impacted by that. All right. I will add in that this, we reviewed a book on something that seems unrelated, consulting. The same view, there's a style of consulting where it says, actually, you don't have the solution. You're interviewing of your, the, customer's user base or the client's user base, they have the solution. And you should tease that solution out. Uh, so it, it resonates with this B10. All right, let's go to, let's go to the, um, Well, ooh, we should probably talk about this universal stuff. Let's go to the Matrix of Domination. Patricia Hill Collins, I've actually read Patricia Hill Collins' Black Fe uh, Feminist Thought uh, book. Uh, so this is familiar to me. Uh, so Patricia Hill Coll Collins, as far as this, uh, he didn't invent intersectionality, intersectionality for whoever's not familiar with it is talking about that you can be in multiple groups. I'm gonna paraphrase, you can be in multiple groups that can be, we'll use this language here, dominated. Um, you know, uh, and that it should be dominated. Uh, this matrix of domination can be a tool for design justice for saying, okay, we have on this side marginalized groups um, and some that are extremely marginalized, some are less marginalized or what have you, and we can use this as a tool. So uh, here, Collins notes, each individual derives varying amounts of penalty and privilege from the multiple systems of oppression which frame everyone's lives. Design justice urge, urges us to consider how design affordances, we didn't talk about affordances yet, but and disaffordances, objects and environments, services, systems, and processes distribute both penalty and privileges to individuals based on their location within the matrix of domination and attend to the ways that this operates in various scales. All right, and this, I think this is important. Uh, Collins notes that people experience and resist oppression on three levels, the level of personal biography, the group or community level of the cultural context created by race, class, 
and gender, and the system level of social institutions, Black feminist thought and emphasizes all three levels as sites of domination and potential sites of resistance. If anyone have any, oh, well, what did you, like Jeffrey, you were really interested in, in this portion. Oh, wait, let's go here. Finally, Black feminist thought emphasizes the value of situated knowledge. So that's your lived experience and so on and so forth over universalist knowledge. In other words, particular insights about the nature of power, oppression, and resistance come from those who occupy subjugated standpoints. I'll stop there. So, did you have some, some of some of this was speaking to you, Jeffrey, this was a big insight for you. Yeah, yeah. Anyone yeah so I mean, just like a, one of my favorite mm -hmm. quotes from a pedagogy of the oppressed is that the, the, the that the um uh the 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 um protest or I forget, and now I'm forgetting exactly how he says it but the 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 cries of the oppressed are not or the demands of the oppressed or I forget what are not always just but if we don't listen to them we'll never understand what justice is. Mm. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I think, does anyone else have anything? The, the matrix of domination. Anything jump out to anyone on the call where this is something that was new to them, counterintuitive, intuitive? so on and so forth, anything. So I'll say, <clears throat> when, when you're people with, with groups like people on the call, like minds, and you're talking about the subject, it can be a controversial subject, people don't like to talk about these types of things. Uh, but, you know, with us, it's not that big of a deal. You can kind of see that, oh, yeah, there's groups that are marginalized or what have you. I think the pushback is uh, there's an intuition there. There's a pushback there, and it's kind of saying victim Olympic. Oh, who's hurt the worst? Let's all basically complain about who's hurt the worst. So I think it needs to be brought out that there's this argument, and she she brings it out um, talking about um, what the right says. Um, who and and even kind of saying that this pushback on the right, like we're we're really the ones who are marginalized the most. Uh, but there's this view of you should on one side somebody's been disenfranchised, oppressed, so on and so forth. The other side, it's it's not oh you haven't been oppressed. It's you're not pragmatic. You're not working hard. If you work hard enough, you will solve the problem. You will be able, you will succeed. You will have upward mobility, You will, so on and so forth. That's really the pushback. Having that in mind when you are reasoning about this matrix of domination, um, knowing what the pushback is, I think is important. Uh, because you, it's a, there's an echo chamber, like they brought out, Google has an echo chamber, I think it was um, in uh, chapter two. Google had an echo chamber of all kinds of, um, uh, where they're kind of thinking that everything is a meritocracy and all, so on and so forth, and, and they were thinking that everything was good, and it wasn't. And there were algorithms 
that were actually racist, so on and so forth. And within the language of, the, of this book, reinforcing the matrix of domination. The, um, it's, I, whenever you're having these conversations, I think that, is, again, it's important to to know what the pushback is, right? It's called the Protestant ethic. If you work hard, you'll be fine. Uh, it, you can say that it's not true. Um, the matrix of domination actually re, um, is too subversive to work through. And some people can work through. Can argue that they were just lucky. All of that, I think, needs to be brought into play when you're reasoning about this subject. Does anybody else have anything? Sue, so is it? Are you saying that that's like a general view to make sure that you're not thinking that you have the silver? spoon that'll do everything or specifically around the design or is this to mm, like a guiding well, principle mm -hmm. or what 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 a what yeah a so within the context of this book mm -hmm. what I found is that there's a lot of this book is talking to I will say that this book's audience is people obviously on the left, people who think that they are they're good natured and that they are let's just say they're designing things or they're making decisions with the best people's best interest in mind, and the book is saying, "No, no, 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 you're not. Here's some other stuff that you need to know about. The audience is completely on the left, right but when you take this statement, this matrix of domination, and you go and engage with the general population of the United States, it's going to be the argument that I said is going to be presented to you, and you need to know it. That kind of thing. Like, they will basically say, this is the victim Olympics that you're talking about. Who is it that can complain the most? and you should just work harder and so on and so forth and they will have plenty of why didn't you do this why didn't you do that kind of things where you could have solved you could have pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps is how i would put it but it would be put in a more eloquent manner so on and so forth so can i give a little pushback on that mm -hmm. i mean it the matrix of domination is also how power is, is exercise. So, I mean, powerful people are powerful because of their <laughs> position in the matrix of domination. They're in a good position to accumulate power. And there, and there are all sorts of ways to look at that. But I mean, you know, it, it, nobody makes it on their own. We're social animals. We're all connected. We get somebody cuts us a break, offers us an opportunity, tells us to do something or not do something, set, uh, gives us a promotion or doesn't give us a promotion. I mean, all of those things that are, are you, this is a framework for looking at where are people situated in that, those power dynamics and that, that it's a matrix. That was what was kind of interesting to me was to think about, oh yeah, there's a matrix, there's rows and columns. People are, they, they're, they occupy a lot of different positions. Like the, you know, uh, Claudia Jones was one of the pioneers of intersectionality and wrote a lot about her triple oppression as a, a woman, as a worker, and as an African-American. And all three of those played in together in terms of what her lived experience was. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> here's, here's a pushback to your pushback. Uh, and this comes from people who know me, from where I'm from. Someone will say, oh, well, Watson's from lower socioeconomic uh, place, foster homes, so, so on and so forth. Watson was able to excel in software and so on and so forth. Why can't you do it? 
right? That kind of thing, right? So someone can always come with what you could call exceptionalism. And my thing is to that you, you, Jeffrey, or someone like you, you're going to have to, even though maybe your experience is not the same as mine, you're going to have to somehow say, well, maybe Watson was lucky. Like you're going to have the uncomfortable position of saying, was he just superior and really good or really hardworking or something like that? Or was he lucky? Like that kind of thing. Like their solution is work is like you said, Protestant ethic. You work hard, you'll be fine. And it can pull up exceptions, exceptionalism all the time. You can say, Obama, all that you could be the president. And your pushback, I'm saying with this thing, it has, I'm going to say, it, it has to be there's some level of luck, there's some level of, of, um, I, I, the main thing is luck, uh, where, no, that's not the solution to the matrix. Of, domination the solution is uh what well, multiple things you're talking about justice needs to be um applied so even if there was a pragmatic there's a pragmatic solution that's not that's not the whole argument the whole part the, the big thrust of the argument is called design justice there's ethical problems going on here where you say no, this say, whole no, this system, whole system needs, needs to be needs to be addressed at every stage. So that's, so that's one really of the nice. What I'm, really what I'm, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say one of the nice things about our author here is an MIT professor. You, uh, there's there it's data. There's a lot of data here, and the argument is, is so. So first of all, we have to establish what are our values. Do we it, uh, do we care that all human beings are able to thrive. I mean, if if we if if I'm talking to somebody who doesn't care, then we have no there's no more conversation to have because we have a fundamental difference in values. So that so then but so assuming that you say, yeah, I do care that all human beings are have an opportunity to thrive, then we can look at the data. It, it's not it, so it, it it they'll always be outliers or whatever they'll always be you know there's it's it's statistical but if you if you look at the that uh that outcomes are predictable statistically then you can say the the matrix of domination is at work mm. so they don't care that all human beings thrive they do care that all human beings that work hard thrive that's the if you were to localize the Amer United States, the American dream, if you work hard, you'll be fine. They don't care that if you don't work hard, that's your decision, you can be on the street. That, that's what you wanna do. But if you add that in, then you gotta come back and say, even though they worked hard, they didn't thrive, and this matrix of domination is there, people have to work twice as hard, that's unethical, that kind of thing. And that, that's all I'm trying to point out is, that's your pushback that you'll get outside of our echo chamber. Uh, because gotcha. you can go all, all day in our echo chamber and you won't hear the pushback. Anyone else? All right. Well. Uh, are there any parts that people really wanted to go over? Let's look at this. Let's design justice is a framework for analysis of how design distributes benefits and burdens between various groups of people. Design justice focuses explicitly on the ways that design reproduces or challenges the matrix of domination, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, ableism, settler, colonialism, and other forms of structural inequality. Design justice is also a growing community of practices or a practice that aims to ensure a more equitable distribution of design benefits and burdens, meaningful participation in design decisions, and recognition of a community-based indigenous and diasporatic design traditions, knowledge, and practices. Well, 
huge statement. Um, really what design justice is, uh, let's see here. Lots of So this is part of where I've, I feel like for me, I was able to reconcile. We work to center histor on uh, historically marginalized communities in the design process. And that's kind of, I want to say, the thrust of the ethical is saying, oh, we have precedent in law or what have you. Here are historically marginalized communities. And then pragmatic, because at the same time, we believe that design follows these principles, can produce images, objects, and products, systems that work better for all of us. I, I'm i focusing on stuff like this because the detractors, let's, say, let's, bring up, let's bring up one detractor of this. Jordan Peterson, he would say, where do you stop? You can't do this because there are too many groups. Your decision to stop on a group is arbitrary and therefore, according to your own framework, is unethical. This here is the argument against that, historically marginalized. So I think that it's consistent and uh, rational and uh, protected against arguments like that. Anyone else have something? Yeah, we've got a bunch more. There's a lot in this book. I feel like we may need to break it up, Watson. Um, what yeah. do you think? I'm fine with it uh, because there are things in um, the uh, further chapters that I think that we can use. So That's I'm kind. Of, I was kind of wondering how much we can. There's a lot of it that feels intuitive and okay. And then it's, well, how do you apply it and where is it going to be a problem? And you've mentioning some of the problems. So it's yeah. eventually gets into application. For, for us, designing a business entity so that there's fairness involved and involving people in the design of it is what jumps out at me. Designing things the first chapter here um they were talking about um resistance groups so on and so forth um how is it that you would design something where the group is going to be oppressed cooperatives are oppressed if you if you become influential at some point uh large enough the other um, businesses that are competing with you, one of the arguments they're going to have against you is, oh, you, you aren't, you aren't, let's just say you aren't capitalist. You're doing things for other reasons that you can say are maybe in a nice way, you can say, ah, oh, they're not, um, they're not pragmatic, they're not going to work. In a more harsh way, they can say it leads to Stalinism or something like that, and you're going to start having a purge or whatever. You're trying to take everyone's stuff, and you want everyone, that kind of thing. So organizing and trying to well, – one of the things we want to do, get more people to be cooperative, software cooperative, so on and so forth, um, that's a – interest of mine, how is it that we are able to collaborate with more people, uh, more groups? And then Jeffrey had some, um, like just some international groups that we uh, coordinate with, so on and so forth. Um, but doing that, there's doing that in the open and there's doing that, you know, strategically and they address some of that. 
in this first chapter here. I guess where it's already eight. So um, does anybody have any other views or um, did they, did they, you know, few people read the book. Uh, any uh, thing that jumped out at them that we so on that, that we we've already gone over. Basically, what I'm saying is the themes of the book. Does anyone have anything else? Well, you know, it's funny that the, in the introduction, and I forget who wrote the the introduction, like the preface or whatever, but they said that their favorite chapter was chapter three, and we and that. I had, you know, I've looked, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in history and I was, uh, that a lot of innovations, particularly in, in the 19th, 18th century were not made by, um, even, you know, centralized, they, they were made by practitioners, people just using stuff would innovate on, um, and, and chapter three points out that the, the, the story that I wasn't aware of, the Twitter story. That was really cool. Uh, 